Hi, I'm Sharon Bill. Welcome to my Music Theory Tuition series where I work with you step by step through the ABRSM Discovering Music Theory grades. I'll work through every single exercise and explain everything you need to know. You can access information about the books I have available to help you on my website. Go to SharonBill.com. For advert free and longer lessons, you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Sharon Bill. If you can give me a like, that would be super. And please do subscribe to my channel to stay updated. You can support this channel by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Sharon Bill. If you turn with me to page 65 of the Grade 5 Discovering Music Theory Workbook, we now move on to the voice and we look at the range of different voices and we look at choral music and here we can see that we have what's known as short score where the sopranos and the altos which are both treble range voices read in treble clef and if you notice the rules of stems is now broken because the usual rule is that once a note is above the middle line the stem should go down and once it's below the middle line the stem should go up however that changes because the soprano because they are sharing the stave with the alto soprano notes all have stems going upwards and alto is all stems going downwards and sometimes just out of interest you can have a note where perhaps they would share and so you'd have a stem up and stem down so it shows that it's both soprano and alto voice. If we were in open score, you'd see, if I just quickly peep over the page, you can see the same piece of music as open score, and we'll look at that later where everybody gets their own line. However, this is the short score version, and we have a little, a little information box here showing us that the soprano is the highest, then we have mezzo, like sort of the, the mid soprano range, alto, sometimes it can be called contralto, we have tenor, baritone is in between the tenor and the bass, and the bass is the lowest. And if you turn to my PDF, if you go to my website, if you go to SharonBill.com, I've got a general idea of the range of each of those voices. The voice parts, of course, can change depending upon each individual singer. However, that's just a general idea of the range that each voice part would manage. And um, I say it's down to the skill of each individual singer or, or the training or the natural ability of the voice to a degree. And here I notice that the Mozart's Queen of the Night aria is mentioned. And this is a really famous uh, example. The, the Queen of the Night solo reaches absolute high, high notes there. And it's a super, super skilled uh, voice part there it's well worth a listen for that just to hear the, the prowess of the the soloists and so we have here a little list however I do suggest that you perhaps get used to uh, just having a quick look and then test yourself it's interesting to notice that actually these parts could also divide if it's a really big choir with a really big kind of scoring we can have first and second sopranos first and second altos first and second tenors first and second basses and so I myself I'm a second soprano so I would be reading this line but sometimes this top line will divide and so the first sopranos would take the absolute top note and the second sopranos take the ap the lower of the two my voice range doesn't like going too high, and so uh, I'll leave those really high notes to the first. And so let's just see if we can just have a little revise of each of these voice parts, and then I suggest don't peep, test yourself, and let's see what we get here. So I'm hoping you've had a go of these, and so let's check these answers together. So is it true or is it false 
that the voice with the highest range is the alto. Well, that's false because the highest range is the soprano. Is it true that the mezzo-soprano is lower than the soprano? This is true, and that makes perfect sense if you think about it. Mezzo, we know mezzo forte, mezzo piano, and so on. Mezzo means sort of moderately, so kind of moderate soprano, middle soprano. Mezzo-soprano is uh, the mid between the soprano and the alto. Is it true or is it false that the baritone is the voice with the lowest range? Well, that's false because the bass is the lowest note. And that makes perfect sense if you think bass, bass clef is the lowest clef. So the bass voice is the lowest voice. Is it true or is it false that the bass is lower in range than the tenor? Yes, that is true because the bass is lower than all of the voice parts. It's the bass, it's the lowest. Is it true or is it false that the tenor is higher than the alto? Well, that's false. It's the higher of the, the lower voices, but it's not higher than the alto. The alto is a treble voice. It's the lower treble voice. And the tenor is the higher in the bass clef. We'll look more at the tenor in the next lesson. However, the tenor, it's usually the case that um, females are alto and males are tenor. Usually the voice range does lend itself to that. However, not all the time. And so in our choir, there have definitely been times when we've had male altos and then we've also had times where we've had female tenors. And if we're a bit short on voice parts, we can, in some cases, if the individual's voice will allow that, we can do a switch. If we're a bit low on altos, some of the more kind of higher pitched tonal quality tenors will lend a hand to the altos. It's not very often that happens though. Is it true or is it false that the baritone is higher in range than the bass? Yes, it is true. Everything is higher than the bass and actually the baritone is the very next one up. Let's turn over the page and here we get a, a closer look at the open score. And it's pretty much exactly as you would imagine. I've just written out the short score just so we can compare rather than keep turning over. So here is the short score. Now there's one slight difference. Notice that the tenor was written as middle C. Whereas now, notice that the tenor is written in what looks like it's the treble clef. However, it's not the treble clef. Notice this little symbol here. And actually, what that means is they are reading this in treble clef, but they're actually singing it an octave lower. And so it's just one of those little quirks of choral music when they are in open score, the tenor jumps into the treble clef, but drops down. And so that gives more credence to the fact that the bass is definitely the lowest because the bass in open score is the only one written in the bass clef. So we have the opportunity now for a little bit of revision. And I guess in this little section here, you could write all sorts of things. We've talked about so many different little information bits and bobs that you could jot down all sorts of things that spring to mind. So you do write down anything that springs to mind for you. You could write down, you could test yourself by trying to write out in order from memory everything that we learned on page 61. So try and write the string family, the woodwind family, the brass, the percussion is perhaps slightly trickier because that doesn't descend in pitch but you could perhaps just bring to mind some interesting facts about the percussion. You could write some little examples of music that will help you to remember each of these. Um, or you could just write down little quirks of um, the sound, what brings this to your memory. 
or you could write down whether it's transposing or non-transposing. So let's just pick a few of these. So I'm just going to pick a few at random. So in the strings, let's deal with the strings. So we have the violin. So the violin is the mainstay of the supporting factor of the orchestra here. So all of this would be violins and it would be split between first violins, second violins. So it's a, a massive chunk of the orchestra. It's non-transposing, it's a, it's a concert pitch. Um, I think if you wanted an example of a violin solo, we have um, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. That's a great one for the violin. Or um, a, a really nice one actually is Beethoven's Violin Concerto in D and actually that opens with a really atmospheric couple of um, timp notes it's just a really sort of quirky introduction that begins with just a bar of a couple of timp notes so that's really interesting uh, what else could we say we could say the next one down is the viola and we know that this reads the alto clef and the reason that we have these different clefts is because, you know, the cello and the bass are the low, the violin is the high, and the viola kind of straddles between the treble and the bass clef, just looking at that there. And so, in order to avoid, you know, if you've got lots of ledger lines coming up from the bass and lots of ledger lines coming down from the treble, you're always, always going to be in ledger lines because of this mid territory and so the alto clef gets rid of the need of too many ledger lines and puts you at home in this middle section between the two clefs. It kind of looks like a violin but slightly bigger because it gives a deeper sound and then of course as the, viol as the violin family, as the string family gets kind of lower in pitch the instruments get bigger and so the cello is now much, much bigger, although it's the same shape as the violin and the viola, much, much bigger, and so it can't be kind of popped under your chin now, so it's placed resting on a, a spike on the floor. It's beautiful. Elgar's cello concerto is just the best. That's a really great one to uh, listen to. And um, it plays mostly in the bass clef, but it can jump into the, the tenor clef as well because it gets quite high. It's range, it does do bass notes, but then it can get quite high. And so instead of having too many ledger lines in the bass clef, it can jump into the tenor clef. And then, of course, we have the bass or the double bass, which is a transposing instrument. It transposes an octave lower. So although it's tuned to C, it is a transposing instrument. Um, and so you could do that again for woodwind. So the highest is the piccolo, which isn't really a solo instrument. It's just um, an addition to the orchestra mostly. I, I guess some 20th century composers may have addressed it as a solo instrument but it's it's quite a strident tone it's very very high um, and that transposes up an octave the flute i don't think the flute really needs too much explanation although it's metal it's still part of the woodwind family because of the the heritage it's it's um it's not reed it's just blown, it's a sideways blown. Um, there are so many amazing flute pieces. Um, there's a lot of foray flute pieces. Foray Sicilian is rather beautiful. I'm rather lost for choice on that. There's so much beautiful flute music. I really like, if you want to try something a little bit more unusual, Debussy, the Syrinx. 
which is for unaccompanied flute, just a solo flute piece. It's slightly bizarre, but it's a haunting beauty to that piece. Um, so that is treble. And then still in the treble, we have the oboe. Uh, and it's a really beautiful instrument, the oboe is. That's a double reed. Then we have the cor anglais. Oh, cor, <laughs> getting carried away. The cor anglais, the English horn, which is in F. It, they are related instruments. Then we have the clarinet, which is transposing to B flat. And then we have the bassoon, which is the base of the woodwind section. Let's do brass. And so the trumpet, that has such a, it's a B flat instrument and it's got such a kind of majestic fanfare kind of quality. Although there are lots and lots of beautiful solos for trumpet as well. It's a beautiful solo instrument as well. It's so, so versatile. It can be lyrical as well. We have the horn which is in F, and Mozart's horn concertos are a beautiful example for that. The trombone, that's the one with the sliding kind of arm, as it were, and that again, it sort of jumps between clefs rather like the cello, it's sort of bass and tenor jumping between those. My uncle used to play the trombone, actually years and years ago. It's a beautiful instrument. Again, it has great lyrical qualities. And then the tuba is the base of the brass section. So there's lots of information to take in there. And I wouldn't worry if it doesn't all sort of sink in absolutely instantly. Just immerse yourself in lots of orchestral music. Just listen to lots of music. You know, just have a little relax and listen to some beautiful music and that counts as work. How marvellous. I hope this is helpful to your studies. Please do like and subscribe to stay updated. If you'd like to support this channel, you can buy me a coffee. And for advert-free lessons, you can become a patron. Do visit my website where you'll find many resources available to help you. Visit SharonBill.com. Thanks for watching. Bye.